Uh, welcome to the name session. Uh, my name is Al Heber. I'm an emeritus professor at Purdue University. I retired about a year ago or so. I, I continue to do private consulting and uh, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation to uh, Ling Ying Xiao. Well, I wanna talk about the National Air Mission Monitoring Study or the names. The, uh, a farm emits several pollutants. Ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, VOCs in particular matter are those which the names addressed. And they, they answer the question, how much is being emitted from each of those? The other pollutants, odor, greenhouse gases, and pathogens were covered by add-on projects actually. So the Clean Air Act provided uh, the basis for having to do this study in that they have thresholds for particulate matter and volatile organic compounds. And there are reporting laws that have thresholds for reporting ammonia and hydrogen sulfide. The Air Consent Agreement was announced in January 2005, and it was an agreement between EPA who would forgive producers for past violations of those laws and rules. And in return, the producers would fund a study that would provide data that they needed because the National Academy of Science said that their database wasn't good enough uh, to support such regulations. The primary objective, there are more objectives, but I only have 20 minutes. So I'm only gonna tell you the primary one. To quantify those uh, emissions from those four pollutants from livestock farms. And here's a couple examples of sites that we measured at. And the way we did it was we measured the airflow of the barn. And if I can see, yeah, right here. There, here there's the airflow being measured. And this is a, uh, the real time measuring on the screen in a previous project actually, but the methods were the same. And then we also measured the outlet exhaust concentration and the inlet exhaust concentration. And using this equation, airflow times outlet minus inlet is equal to the emission rate. So that's how we did it. In November of, 2000, uh, of 1993, there was a meeting of scientists from all over the country to uh, debate on how to do the study that was going to be required by the ACA. Is it going to be intensive or extensive? Will we use cha sampling chambers or open path? Will we look at whole farm measurements with an open path? or look at uh, farm components like barns and lagoons? What kind of supporting data needs to be recorded? And will a public contractor be used or a private contractor? And what about farm selection? How do we select those farms? Or how will the farms be selected? One of the things that was decided during that two and a half day workshop was the structure of the independent monitoring contractor. And it was to be uh, a leadership team headed by one person, okay, here we go. Um, so the independent monitoring co contractor, which ended up being Purdue University, I was the director, but the AARC, which took money from the commodity groups and it flowed through this not-for-profit organization to Purdue University. The US EPA was an equal partner as they oversaw all the quality assurance for that project. This is the leadership team and we subcontracted with air quality expertise at other universities that were close to the sites that to, were to be monitored. The open source study was done by Dr. Rich Grant. He had his team that uh, conducted those measurements at the area sources, the lagoons, the corrals. So we ended up having 16 swine barns, 10 dairy barns, uh, eight layers and two broilers. And over on the Area side, 10 total, six swine, one included, one was a basin, and four dairy, one was a corral. But we have more for the ACA, uh, not included in the names, but qualified for the uh, air, air consent agreement was, were, were two broiler farms in Kentucky. And those broiler farms are, are seen right here. They qualified for the ACA, not part of names. But you can see that the sites that we monitored were distributed all over the country. And the, two, the area sites were, were measured using roving teams that would visit each site for 10 days during each quarter for two years. Here are pictures of those. This is a purple lagoon in North Carolina. The corral 
in Texas, a sow farm, a sow lagoon uh, in Oklahoma. Here's the, the basin in Iowa, and there's another dairy lagoon there. Now let's talk about the timeline for the names. First of all, after it was developed, the protocol had to be developed with follow-on conference calls for the next several months on how the farm, what farms should be selected, what kinds of farms, what types. And, uh, and, then as, and then at Purdue, there was a selection of PI, staffing and budgeting going on. And then after, the, after it was announced, the ACA in 2005, then the producers had time to sign up. And then following that, the EPA reviewed those consent agreements. And as the time approached uh, for the study to actually occur, we had to first develop, we actually had to write about 2,000 pages of standard operating procedures and site monitoring plans. And the EPA reviewed those intensively. And then after that was finished, then we signed the contract, Purdue signed the contract with the AARC, and the names was, was conducted here starting out with equipment acquisition, a Purdue training session with all the PIs and uh, site setup, which occurred, it took about a year to get everyone signed up or set up to actually take measurements. And data collection then occurred for two years. So the names collected continuously, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, PM, and airflow, wind and air velocity. But there were some integrated sampling done with, uh, for, for VOCs, we used canisters for 24 hours and sent those samples to a lab for GC mass spec analysis. And for odor in the add-on projects by USDA, they gave a half a million dollars to measure odor, very nice project. Uh, Ted Tedlar bags were filled over a period of two or three minutes and uh, were evaluated by olfactometry. The manure storage, uh, used TDLAS sensors for ammonia and synthetic open path for hydrogen sulfide. And there's a couple of the models they would use to back calculate. And so all these livestock barns were measured with the same protocol, which was nice. But the nice, we had 2,300 sensors and two and a half billion data points. But the nice thing about this two-year study is that we have data across seasons, across, across growth periods, and across manure accumulations, which Probably never was done before like that. And the supporting data, we measured the process, and this is a different definition of process, is uh, worker and animal activity. Uh, we even operated, uh, monitored doors and lights in some sites. But we also analyzed the biomaterial, which is a, which is a catch all word for feed, egg, milk, you know, the nitrogen in those um, materials. We measured the weather and also the environment inside the building. We also documented farm characteristics very carefully. We even measured the dimensions of the buildings and all the parts and pieces and um, monitored animal inventories. And uh, we also recorded major events like molting, disease outbreaks, et cetera. Now, there were some constraints and limitations to this study as there is with any study and budget was a constraint to doing everything we maybe wanted to do. And also the real time VOCs that we tried to do just didn't work at all. Uh, so that's a downer. But the data complexity um, limited us, well, it, it's a limit. In, in other words, it was a challenge to analyze data because it took a lot of time and, and careful, careful work. Ventilation methods were definitely a limitation. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, producer participation in the ACA. They had, to they had to sign the dotted line before we could select them as a site. And did you know that not one dairy farm in Minnesota signed up? So we had to go to Wisconsin for the University of Minnesota. Now, I told you a little bit about what the names did, but what the names did not do was to remove or adjust negative concentrations. We just didn't do that. EPA advised us not to. We did not remove or adjust negative emissions that were calculated. There's a good reason for that. There, there's definitely a good reason. In some cases, the barn might be a sink for some pollutants. And uh, so we, we didn't invalidate those, and I still don't think they should be. We did not measure worker or animal exposure. The exhaust fans are often way downstream of where the birds and animals are. For example, in a high-rise layer house, the airflow goes through that pit before it leaves, and it picks up a lot of ammonia, but the birds aren't exposed to that kind of a concentration. But what we reported were the exhaust concentration. 
And it, we did not measure downwind exposure. So some environmental groups would take our inlet concentration average and say, oh my goodness, it's way higher than the, than the NACs. Well, our, and we used ambient concentration in our reports. And so they confused that with this ambient concentration. You can't, this is not the same. And I'll show you a little bit of data later. Now I have tons of slides, hundreds and hundreds of slides on picked with pictures, but I'm only gonna show you five because I don't have enough time. And this is the on-farm instrument shelter, just to show you a little bit what it looks like at each site. These are some of the methods that we use to measure ventilation airflow rate. Um, we used, uh, we measured the RPM of the fan, we measure static pressure, and we even used on-farm or portable fan testers and brought them to the site for spot testing. The gas sampling looked a little bit like this. We used Teflon tubes, sequential, sampling from various points throughout the buildings. And that was done with a gas sampling system, which kind of looks like this. Uh, air would kind of come through here through a selected line through the sampling manifold. The pressure in the vacuum and the uh, flow rate were carefully measured to detect leaks. And then the air would flow, the sample air would flow through the analyzer manifold from which these analyzer would draw a subsample. Particular matter monitoring was done at the inlets and outlets of the building. And uh, you can see we use beta gauge and T-ohms and this would be what we monitored most of the time was PM10, but every eight weeks we would throw a TSP head on and then uh, every twice a year we would measure PM2.5. And this is, these are the pictures of the, VO, the SUMA canisters that were placed at the exhaust fan and this is the GC mass spec, 24 hours. We did not measure inlet concentration. Here's an example site monitoring plan for the broiler farm. And as you can see, whoops, um, we measured, these little red circles show where the gas concentrations were measured. And you can see this is at the exhaust fan. That looks like my exhaust fans fell off the wall there. But, um, Air comes in this way, and you can imagine when little chicks are on fresh, fresh litter, there's no hardly any ammonia. But then when the air passes slowly across the old litter, it picks up a ton of ammonia. Another reason why the exhaust concentration do not indicate what the birds are exposed to. Now, here's an, here's an interesting chart. I, I plotted the average ammonia concentrations at each, for each site along with the average inlet concentration. So, uh, and, and then we can look at where the minimum detection limit for the instrument is, and it's kind of on the order of magnitude of the inlet concentrations. And then this is the odor threshold for ammonia, and this is log scale, so that's why it looks that way. And the layer facilities had the highest ammonia concentrations. And they also had the highest inlet concentration because they're surrounded by other large houses and there's a cloud of ammonia around the farm. But, and then the lowest concentrations were coming out of the dairy barns and these two are naturally ventilated. Now, the, can you see a problem there? We're trying to use this equation and if we don't have much of a, a difference here, we're gonna have a problem with a good accuracy, right? And look at that difference. They're almost the same. Why would they be the same? Well, that particular, barn, those two barns were just a roof. No, no walls, no curtains, nothing year round. Whereas this naturally ventilated building at least had some curtains and some walls uh, partial. So we we're, were able to publish some of this data. Similarly with uh, hydrogen sulfide, we, we see the same issue. Um, there's the minimum detection limit. The, the, the highest hydrogen sulfide concentrations coming out of the buildings where it was swine. And with those two dairy facilities, again, we see the same thing uh, as we did with ammonia. Now I wanna just show you some interesting things we saw from, from the name study in addition to just the emission rates. And one was uh, there was a management change uh, at the Wisconsin dairy. And what they did was they changed from flushing out of the lagoon to get the manure out of the barn to scraping the manure. And you can see what happened to hydrogen sulfide. 
The hydrogen sulfide here was coming from the lagoon as that water was being used to flush. As soon as they scraped, the hydrogen sulfide went away. Here's another case. We wondered why are we getting so much hydrogen sulfide from the Iowa South facility? And we wondered if there was a problem with our measurements until we looked at the water samples and the high sulfur content in the water and, and the mass balance explained it all. Um, also look at the broiler facility there and we could plot with age, broiler age over 13 cycles, what happened with hydrogen sulfide emissions. And we can do the same thing with ammonia uh, as, as a function of broiler age. And over at the Indiana dairy facility, we see in a dairy facility, a freestall, not heated, wide temperature range. And we could see over that wide temperature range, a, a huge dependence of ammonia on temperature. These are ammonia emissions. Now looking at VOCs, we actually looked at 70 VOCs and that took about a year for the GC mass spec lab to get all the methods figured out for 70 VOCs. And those of you who have run GC labs would understand. And the VOC emissions, we, we ended up taking all of our seven sets that we promised in the year 2009. And uh, we can see the effect of broiler age on VOC emissions there as well. We had a nice greenhouse gas add-on project where we could measure greenhouse gases at dairy facilities. And just very briefly, the average, overall average was 354 in grams per day per cow, and from the literature, that's in the ballpark. With nitrogen oxi nitrous oxide, about two, and it agreed pretty well with the literature, and also with CO2. Now, bear in mind that a lot of these studies are very short. Uh, they're, they're not as comprehensive and, and, um, as, as the names, but uh, we, we, we didn't measure these for two years either. It was more like six months that we were measuring these. Okay. Now we had some challenges along the way. We had everything from lightning strikes to disease outbreaks, uh, faulty uh, rodent damage to cables and the changes to the farm management that we had to deal with. Now what happened after the study was over, we EPA development of emission estimating methodology that was supposed to be shorter, but it's ended up being longer. Uh, Purdue dispersed their equipment. The commodity groups had, I guess they owned it, so they, they could decide what to do with it. Uh, some disappointed PIs. We, there was further data analysis. We had some money left over, so the commodity group said, hey, why don't you analyze further? And we submitted some long reports to each of those species uh, on that. And the science advisory panel, scientific advisory panel was formed to review uh, the initial draft EEMs from EPA. And then that resulted in a completeness criteria project where I was asked to recalculate some of the barn emission data based on different criteria. Instead of 75%, what about some of the other percentages that could be used to validate an hourly or daily average? Submitted that. And then the Office of Inspector General did a review and uh, a report and I, I believe that resulted in uh, the full-time position for EEM development. And I'm happy, I'll be happy to in, um, introduce the, the person that fills that here as, as, as soon as I'm finished. During this entire time, the media has, has done interviews. And in fact, just a, a, about a month ago, I got another call. And we've been publishing scientific articles. There are 46 articles now uh, published, including just this year. Uh, Rich Grant has published the last six, and he is going to complete all the area source uh, publications, doing a great job. And I would like to acknowledge where the funding came from, uh, the oversight and insight uh, that came from other uh, various people and organizations and the cooperation and the support of farms, site PIs, engineers, and data analysts. And with that, and we won't ask questions, we're gonna keep the questions for later.